Good morning and welcome to the Sarium Holdings PLC Final Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Dr. Stephen Parker, non-executive chairman. Good morning, sir. Oh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the Sarian Holdings presentation for the full year ending 30th of June 2023. I'm Stephen Parker, Chairman of the company, and I'm joined today by Dr. Tim Mitchell, Sarian CEO, and Dr. John Reader, our Chief Scientific Officer. So without more ado, I'll hand you over to Tim to begin. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, everybody. Um, so first, I just need to draw your attention to the usual disclaimer for the results statements. Uh, so this discussion may contain forward-looking statements uh, with respect to clinical plan strategy, financial performance that may cause our actual results, performance or plans to differ from those expressed on the call. Before we get into the detail of the discussion, I'll just take a moment to introduce Sarim for the benefit of those of you who are new to the company uh, and a recap for those of you who know us quite well. So Sarim is a clinical stage biotechnology company and we're developing next generation kinase inhibitors for autoimmune diseases and cancer. We have a deep expertise in kinase emission and the jack cell signaling family in particular. And this is a growing um, area of commercial focus with good scientific validation. And our particular focus uh, amongst this jack family is the TIC2 jack1 uh, kinase inhibitors. Our lead program, SDC1801, is a novel dual TIC2 JAK1 kinase inhibitor, which is currently in a phase one clinical trial. Uh, so th this is in healthy volunteers. Uh, and in the first instance, we're intending to target psoriasis, which will be the clinical focus for the phase one B stage of the trial. Our strategy, as, as it's always been, is to develop our research programs uh, to the late preclinical or early clinical stages uh, before licensing or partnering uh, to pharmaceutical majors. And we're expecting to report key, key clinical milestones for SDC1801 in particular uh, throughout 2023 and 2024. I'll summarize the key developments we've achieved over the year here then. Um, so for um, SDC1801 and the, the, the TIC2 JAK1 programs, uh, as I've already noted, our, the lead program is now in phase 1A. Uh, and that study is being undertaken in Australia. The objective of the, of the study is to evaluate the safety and pharmacokinetics of an oral formulation of SDC1801. This study was initiated in May, uh, with first subjects being dosed in June, and it's progressing very well at a specialist clinical unit in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, in, and in September, as you may have seen, after the, this period end, uh, we started dosing in the multiple ascending dose phase of the, uh, the of the clinical trial. So this move to the, the to the so-called MAD phase uh, followed approval by the safety review committee after the plan review of the preliminary data from the first three co um, cohorts in the single uh, ascending dose uh, part of the first bit of the study. John will take you through more details of this uh, later in the presentation. Uh, in, our, in addition to the progress in the clinic for 1801 uh, in June, Sorin was granted the first patent specifically for SDC1801 and just happened to be in China. Uh, and patent pro uh, applications progressing uh, through the offices in the US, Europe, and, and other major territories. Alongside SDC1801, Sorin has a second TIC2 jack kinase inhibitor. Um, this is SDC1802, which we believe hold, holds significant potential in both uh, in, in cancer and cancer immunotherapy. Uh, for this, translational studies continue. Uh, we still need to define the, the optimal cancer application before we, uh, before we move on to the necessary toxicology and manufacturing uh, work for preparation for clinical trials for that compound. Alongside the TIC2 JAK1 portfolio, uh, we continue to be optimistic about the potential for our CHECK1 inhibitor, SRA737, which has demonstrated good clinical and preclinical efficacy. As you may have seen, uh, Sierra Oncology, which is now a subsidiary of GSK, 
has returned the clinical study reports and other associated documents and data relating to, uh, to SR837 uh, to our co-development partner, uh, CPF, the, the Cancer Research Technology Pioneer Fund. And CPF are taking the lead in evaluating uh, the opportunities and next steps for, for SRA737. So we're really waiting for further developments from, from them and we'll report those as soon as we're able. To summarize the financial results, uh, we reported a loss for the 12 months to June of 3.2 million. Uh, so that's an increase over the, the last year, but it reflects the higher uh, research and development costs involved with late preclinical development and preparation for these clinical studies. Cash at the end of the period was, was 1 million. Uh, and after the period ends, we announced a funding facility worth up to 5 million uh, with a group called Riverfort, of which 2 million has so far been received to date. Uh, after, after the period end, uh, we also received a, uh, an R&D tax incentive from the Australian government, uh, and that was worth uh, 400,000 pounds approximately. Uh, the slide here just is, shows the, the pipeline in, in a visual form. Um, as you can see, SDC 1801 has now moved into clinical phase one. We have 737 completed two phase one, two clinical trials. Uh, but our primary focus here is on um, advancing uh, SDC 1801 through its phase one trials. Before we move on to the technical parts of the presentation, I'll just spend a bit of time on the TIC2 Jack 1 landscape and set out why we're so excited about this approach. So this is a space that's had increasing scientific and commercial momentum in recent years, um, as more and more evidence grows around the role that Jack signaling can have in managing autoimmune diseases in particular. So TIC2 and Jack 1 are involved in signaling pathways that are deregulated in many autoimmune diseases, including psoriasis and also lupus, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel diseases, and, and many others. We've seen greater recognition by large pharma and other developers of the potential that the TIC2 class in particular has to offer patients with autoimmune diseases. And the approval last year of the Bristol Myers Squibb TIC2 inhibitor, so TIC2, by the FDA in the US and then this year by the European regulators was, in, was important to us because it was the first specific TIC2 inhibitor to gain approval. Uh, and we believe that this approval uh, validates and significantly de-risks our approach. BMS are forecasting uh, peak sales of 4 billion for, for so TIC2. So there's a good understanding of the commercial potential of the TIC2 class out there. And then uh, I said more, more aligned with our uh, business model, we're very interested to see from December last year, the acquisition of Nimbus Therapeutics uh, phase two stage TIC2 inhibitor by the Japanese pharmaceutical company Takeda. And this was for a $4 billion cash payment up front. And then there's a further 2 billion available to Nimbus in sales milestones. Uh, so having introduced uh, Sarium and, and the TIC2 space, I'll hand over to John Reader, uh, to walk us through why we think our TIC2 Jack 1 combination has great potential in this area. Thank you, Tim, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, again, to the background that uh, Tim set out, we think the combination of TIC2 and Jack 1 has particular potential for a few reasons. We've known for a while of the potential of Jack signaling in autoimmune disease, uh, but safety has been a concern. BMS is so TIC2 molecule, uh, which is very selective for TIC2, was approved significantly without one of these so-called uh, black box warnings, unlike some of the first generation JAK inhibitors, such as uh, tofacitinib and maracitinib, which inhibit all of the JAKs to some extent. So we know that so TIC2 has a better safety profile. We believe SDC1801, by combining TIC2 with JAK1 inhibition, has the potential to increase efficacy without compromising that safety. Uh, furthermore, TIC2, JAK1 uh, are good targets for several autoimmune diseases, uh, which opens potential for us to explore other indications.
Um, so very high level, just walking through the science behind our proprietary pipeline. The Jack family is involved with maintaining balance in the immune system. TIC2 and Jack one are involved in signaling pathways that are implicated in multiple autoimmune diseases, notably psoriasis, but also a host of other autoimmune diseases such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease, so that's uh, Crohn's disease, ul ulcerative colitis, uh, also lupus and, and several others. The inhibition of both TIC2 and JAK1 has the potential to yield superior efficacy compared with those agents that block just one of the two kinases. So TIC2 and JAK1, we believe therefore make optimal targets within the JAK family for autoimmune diseases. As targeting other members such as uh, JAK2 and JAK3 in particular has led to unwanted side effects in some patients, leading to the black box warnings on the earlier first generation JAK inhibitors. So moving on to the next slide, I mean, we've touched on this already, but to provide a bit more detail about where we currently are in the clinical development plan. We're in a phase 1A trial at a clinical unit in Australia. This is exploring the safety and tolerability and the pharmacokinetics of an oral formulation of SDC1801 in healthy subjects. Uh, we've progressed to what's called the multiple ascending dose, the, the MAD phase of the trial, and the single ascending dose phase is continuing through dose escalation. Uh, the trial is blinded, and that means that neither we, uh, the principal investigators, uh, the medical monitors, and importantly, the participants, none of those people know which subjects receive SDC1801 and which receive placebo. And yeah, obviously, we appreciate there's keen interest in the trial's progress, but given its blinded design, we will need to wait until the trial is completed before we can provide full details on the safety profile. Um, that said, what we have shared already is that the initial safety um, indicates a, a, a favourable safety profile, and very importantly, the PK data supported once daily oral dosing, which I think is very important for commercial purposes. Uh, subject to continuing good safety data um, and financing, regulatory and recruitment considerations, our intention is to commence the phase 1B uh, phase of the trial in psoriasis patients in 2024. The synthesis of the drug substance uh, for SDC 1801 and of the capsules for the clinical trial have been uh, successfully completed. And the current plan is to recruit up to 120 subjects in total, and that's 96 for phase 1A, and 24 patients for phase 1B. And the anticipated timelines of the trial are shown in the arrow below. Uh, so again, you know, subject to financing, uh, regulatory approval and recruitment going to plan, we'd anticipate a phase 1B readout before the end of 2024. Turning briefly to SDC1802, our cancer immunotherapy program. Uh, this is an immunomodulating inhibitor of the TIC2 JAK1 family, which we believe has potential both in cancer and autoimmune disease. Uh, SDC1802 has demonstrated good efficacy in preclinical cancer models. We're working on translational studies uh, with the aim of defining the optimal cancer applications before moving into a phase one trial. Uh, we think that the experience of clinical development of SDC1801 will support the development plan for SDC1802, so the molecules are structurally quite related. And during the period, we were pleased to have been granted a patent by the um, US Patent Office covering the treatment of autoimmune diseases by SDC1802, uh, which further expands for protection for this compound beyond immuno-oncology. Moving on to SRA737 then, our check one inhibitor, um, just to update you. I mean, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the history here, um, but SRA737 was developed by Sarium in collaboration with um, several cancer research, UK funded organizations, 
uh, including the current co-development partnership that we have with the Cancer Research Technology Pioneer Fund, CPF. Under the terms of our co-development partnership, Sorium is entitled to 27.5% of any commercialization revenues associated with SRA 737. Um, 737 has completed two phase one, two clinical trials, which were funded by Sierra Oncology. And the asset demonstrated a good safety profile and promising clinical and preclinical efficacy, and particularly in combination settings. Sierra Oncology was subsequently bought by GSK, uh, driven by its interest in another of uh, Sierra's assets. And GSK decided to return SRA 737 um, and all of the clinical study reports and data uh, and materials have now been received from, um, from Sierra. CPF is evaluating potential licensing opportunities. Uh, we're very optimistic about the potential of this molecule and we think there's scope for further development, but CPF is leading this process. Um, I'll now hand back to Tim to cover the, uh, the financials. Thank you, John. So to briefly summarize the, the, finance, the financial results that we published on Monday, uh, looking at the income statement then, um, so I've already mentioned higher R&D expenses that are associated with the setup and the start of the phase one trial, um, being responsible for the increased uh, operating expenses. Uh, so the loss for the year was uh, 3.2 million this year compared to 2.2 million this, this year, but um, fully in line with market expectations, and as I say, reflecting these R&D costs. Uh, if you look on the tax line, um, there's, uh, there's plus 833,000, so, so that represents the R&D tax credits. Um, we, as, as we noted in the results RNS, we've already received uh, the cash credit from the Australian government of, of around about 400,000 uh, pounds, and the rest we'll expect from the UK government. Uh, we normally get it around the end of the year, uh, maybe, maybe early in the new year. Uh, moving to the balance sheet then, um, so we had a cash position at the at the end of June of 1 point million, oh uh, yeah, 1 million, um, but of course this doesn't include the finance facility from Riverfort, uh, uh, which I'll, I'll just touch on in a minute, but we've, we've so far received 200, uh, 2 million uh, from that, and that, that was in August, so, so the, uh, well, we're, we're able to manage our cash resources uh, very successfully. So, so just to recap on the Riverfort facility, uh, as I say, this was agreed in uh, after the period end. Um, so the facility is for five million pounds, um, and that will enable us to complete the phase one A and B development of uh, 1801 if it's fully drawn. Uh, plus, also it, it, when if we're in receipt of the expected tax credits, uh, so we've received two million so far. Um, there's a further two payments of 300,000 each, um, one in November, uh, one in February, they're committed. Um, and then an additional 1.4 million due in February. So, so these are six months anniversaries. That, that's how the timings are working out. Uh, they're, they're subject to standard trading conditions. And then beyond that, a further 1 million is available by mutual agreement. So, so that's, that's essentially the bones of, of the agreement. Okay, so that's that's the the main parts of the presentation. Um, I'll finish by summarising our progress before we hand over to the Q and A. So we're very optimistic about the potential offered by uh, Tick Two Jack One Kinase, as, as I hope we demonstrated in the presentation, um, because of the the efficacy and safety benefits they can offer, and the growing commercial excitement around them. Uh, so, so this is the, the basis of our conviction in our pipeline. Hopefully we've shown you that STC1801 is a differentiated asset in this space, which we believe has the potential to yield superior efficacy whilst maintaining a good safety profile. Uh, we're funded to the next clinical inflection point, so that's the end of the phase 1B study. Uh, the Riverfort facility and the uh, tax receipts 
uh, will give us uh, enough runway to complete this phase 1AB clinical development. Um, so with that, I will thank you for listening to the presentation. I hope it was useful and we'll take some questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we received a number of questions, both pre-submitted and throughout today's live presentation. And Lauren, at this point, if I may just hand over to you to chair the q and I'll pick up with me at the end. Great. Thank you, Alessandro, and good morning, everyone. Is the board able or willing to comment further on the progress of the 1801 trial, a question which is on all shareholders' lips? If not, then when do they anticipate they might be able to do so? Uh, I'll take this one. Uh, this is John. Um, so, yeah, like, <laughs> well, we appreciate the keen interest in the progress of the 1801 trials, obviously. Um, it, it, it's very difficult. So. Currently, the Phase 1A trial is advancing as planned um, at the Specialist Clinical Unit in, in Melbourne. Um, as announced, we've transitioned from a single ascending dose phase to the multiple ascending dose phase. And that was following a review of the preliminary data from the initial uh, three SAD cohorts. Uh, the comprehensive safety data from the Phase 1A trial is anticipated during the first half of 2024. Um, as I mentioned, the trial's blinded, so neither we nor the investigators or subjects are aware of which subjects are dosed with SDC 1801 or with placebo. Um, but again, as reported, the, the initial safety data and the PK data uh, was looking good, indicates a favorable safety profile, supported once daily oral dosing. and. Just to sort of put a bit of flesh on the bones, the way these um, studies progress, so a, a cohort is dosed, uh, lots of sampling is done, lots of readings are taken, you know, physiological readings, etc. And then all of that data is presented to a safety review committee at the end of the cohort. That's all reviewed, and only when that is deemed successful uh, is the next cohort uh, ready for dosing. So um, the sort of cycle times like that, and um, the three SAD cohorts were, were reviewed before moving on to a MAD. So um, this, is, this is how it all works. I, we're committed to providing accurate and timely information and, and as and when there are significant developments, shareholders will be promptly informed. Thank you. Um, along similar lines, again asking about the completion timing but also how long will it take for the analysis and for you to come to a decision based on the data obtained as to whether to proceed with a phase 1b yeah um well again yeah so we're in the mad phase um the sad phase is continuing i think you yeah, know we're, we're, <laughs> we're very optimistic we'll have all of this phase 1a completed and data received and fully analysed by the end of half one, 2024, hopefully sooner. But some of this is out of our control. So, th you know, things like recruitment, um, capacity at the unit, for example. So, we're, you know, just, we're just being slightly cautious about timelines here. But so far, it's all gone to plan. It's all gone on schedule. So we're optimistic we'll have that all completed uh, by the end of 2024. Oh, sorry, by the end of half one, 2024. Um, the phase 1A, just as a reminder, comprises three parts. So we've got the single ascending dose, the multiple ascending dose, and there's also a food effect study, which we haven't really touched on today, but that's investigating how uh, food affects the, the, the PK or the uptake of SDC 1801. Um, and each part of the study consists of multiple cohorts or groups of subjects. Um, and, and as I've said, they, the, the data from them need to be reviewed by a safety review committee before we move on to the next phase. But I think, you know, the start of the MAD phase demonstrated that the single ascending dose uh, study has, has been going well. The safety profiles have been good. Otherwise, we would not have been allowed to begin the MAD phase. Um, but the exact timing of the subsequent phases de depends on several factors, so, you know, recruitment, capacity in the clinical unit, etc. cetera. 
Thank you. When do the board expect to receive the 1801 patents for the US, Europe and other territories? And how important is it to have these outstanding patents granted before any future potential license deal? Um, okay, I'll take this one as well. It, it, it's, unfortunately, it's not an exact science, so we can't give any prediction or forecast when the various patent offices will pick our case for examination. Um, you know, really, we could hear something next week, or it might be another year, or even longer. Um, we just don't get any any warning of, of when they're going to pick up our particular docket and start to start to deal with it, uh, which can be frustrating. But I think you know what's important is that the Chinese Patent Office has granted our 1801 case, and it's essentially the same application in the other territories. There are some very minor technical differences, just to satisfy the different territories' uh, requirements, but essentially we're looking to protect the same molecules and with the same data. So I think the fact that uh, it was granted in China has given us a great deal of confidence that it will be approved in the other territories when they do come to examine it. Uh, and the other part of the question was how that might affect future license deals. Uh, you know, I, so it would be helpful if we had the granted patent, but it's not essential. And again, I think the fact that the patent was granted in China uh, will give reassurance to anybody who's performing due diligence on our intellectual property that the patent is very likely to be granted in the other territories as well. So I think really getting that first patent uh, away is, is, is absolutely crucial in validating the approach. Okay, still sticking with 1801, uh, can we have clarification on 1801's progress with regards to being developed to combat severe respiratory diseases? Yeah, um, so uh, hopefully as you picked up from the presentation, our current focus and um, priority is on the development of, F of SDC 1801 for autoimmune diseases, um, particularly psoriasis. Um, and we believe that that current direction will best position the molecule to address significant unmet medical needs uh, within the autoimmune disease space, and that will deliver value to shareholders. But there is um, broader potential for SDC 1801, uh, both in autoimmune diseases, which we've mentioned, but also in other indications such as um, you know, severe respiratory diseases, or the, the cytokine storm that was seen recently in the, uh, in the COVID pandemic. Um, we did some preclinical research in COVID. It, it certainly looked interested. The, the results were positive, but I don't think we're envisaging undertaking any further preclinical studies. So any next step for 1801 would be in patients with um, severe respiratory distress. Uh, and that would be possible if we've successfully completed the current phase 1A studies. So the data that we're generating at the moment could be applicable to um, severe respiratory diseases uh, if, if that's deemed a priority. But I think certainly for the moment, the priority is the autoimmune disease applications. Okay, um, moving on. At the AGM, it was stated that you hope to get a signal of efficacy for 1801 from the phase 1B, and it may be enough to open up conversations. Does the board have a plan or options on the table for funding working capital beyond quarter four 2024 if a license deal isn't forthcoming at that point? Uh, I'll, I'll take that then. Thanks, Lauren. It's Tim. Um, so, as we've seen, the current plan is to complete the phase 1B of 1801 by the end of 2024. Um, I think we see that as a key inflection point where we'll have a good data package and one that we can. Uh, compared to our competitors who have um, who have been, who've run similar phase 1A, B trials. Uh, so we'll obviously have a big push on licensing the product at that point. Um, if an attractive licensing deal isn't available, um, then we'll look at other um, financing options to advance our pipeline. And we can't, I suppose, we can't really speculate on what those might be at this stage. Okay, and then with cash burn being an ever more important factor for Sorium, what is the board strategy to ensure we remain well funded to complete our planned activities? 
Okay. Um, so, so certainly in the, well, the, the the medium term, the the river fort facility, assuming it's fully drawn, uh, plus our anticipated tax credits, uh, allow us to complete the phase one B, and and that's really the uh, that's the priority for, for us is to, is to complete that phase one B of SDC 1801. Okay. And maybe sticking on, on this light, um, why did the company choose the funding arrangement with Riverfort as opposed to securing investment from high net worth individuals or institutional investors? How do you justify that this is the best available option for the company at the current time? Okay. Um, so uh, the management team and the board uh, and, and along with our advisors, uh, we assessed various funding options uh, during the late summer uh, and, and carefully considered uh, them all on their merits. Um, of those, we found this prepayment facility with Riverfort to be the best option available to us uh, to enable us to flexibly fund our further uh, progress. Um, to say, yeah, so the structure of the facility gives us potential to access capital uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice, flexible and controlled manner. Uh, but obviously, we'll still continue to assess all opportunities that would uh, serve the company's growth and development should other funding opportunities arise. OK, um, switching gears a little bit, we've had a number of questions relating to 737. I'll read um, some of them out here. So first, last December, there was talk of conversations with numerous interested parties. What's the latest on this? Second, upon return of 737, the board indicated that there was good interest in the compound. Can you please reiterate if there is still significant interest? And another one, things seem to have gone quiet. Has there been any progress? OK, um, so, so as, as John pointed out during the presentation, that this is being led by CPF. Uh, uh, as uh, as you're, you're aware, they're the major partner. We, we, we own 27.5% of the programme that they own the other 72.5%. So as a major partner, um, they're responsible for the, uh, the ongoing commercialisation of the programme. Um, we're not able to provide any updates about the status of any business discussions that might be going. I, I know I appreciate that might be frustrating to some people, um, but we, we 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 can't say anything until till we have something significant and concrete to say. But of course, we'll update uh, the market as soon as there's anything significant to report. OK, um, jumping to 1802. What time scale are we looking for um, for 1802 to go into toxicology studies? And when do you expect 1802 to progress to the next stage of development? Uh, OK, I'll, yeah, I'll take this. It's John again. So uh, as mentioned, we're still working on the translational studies for SDC 1802. So trying to determine the optimal cancer application for the molecule. And once we've finalized those, we can then move forward into the toxicology studies and the other preclinical development um, issues. So the synthesis of the molecule on scale, formulation and synthesis of the uh, formulated product. Um, we should be quite quick once we get going on that because we do have a lot of compound in hand already. So we can move to the toxicology studies quite rapidly. But I can't really give a, um, a definite timeline on that at the moment. But, you know, just to say, we'll keep uh, our shareholders updated as we reach milestones in the, in the development process. OK, thanks, John. Uh, another question here. So with Sarium in phase one now, has there been an increase in the level of conversations on deals with possible partners? I.e., is Sarium getting noticed? Uh, we're certainly being noticed. Yeah, so it's, it's Tim again. Um, so, yeah, we, we're seen as a clinical player in this space. And I think, yeah, that's an important step um, in that um, the programme is significantly de-risked now that we have got approval to go into the clinic. So independent assessors have looked at the data and says, yes, that's suitable for uh, clinical development. And obviously, um, moving, moving on to the MAD phase, uh, again, um, uh, real humans um, volunteers have, have taken, uh, well, in this case, single doses of, of 1801, and the, the safety review committee has uh, considered that it, it's it, it's all fine for for the, the trial to progress into the multiple sending dosage stage. So there's 
<coughs> excuse me, um, there's some good validation coming in and obviously um, uh, potential pharmaceutical partners uh, like to see all that. Um, so we can't comment in detail um, about the status of any discussions. Again, they're obviously commercially confidential, uh, but we continue to engage with potential partners as part of our ongoing business development activities. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, what key milestones are you hoping to hit before the end of 2023? Uh, shall I pick that one up? Um, so in terms of the, um, the 1801 trial, the, uh, the single sending dose stage should finish by the end of the year. Um, so we, we will um, have an understanding of the maximum single dose that our volunteers can take. Um, and then also the, the food effects study, which John mentioned, that is expected to start before the end of the year. As an example of some... Uh, uh, some trial milestones that will continue um, and then yeah but for the other programs we can't really speculate on on what and when milestones will be hit okay thank you you've guided that cash is sufficient to quarter four 24 and that we can expect safety data in the second half of 24 for the phase 1a b Thinking about the Nimbus Takeda deal for a phase two asset for four billion, can you give us a rough guide as to what range of costs you think about internally for a phase two for 18 or one? Um, okay, so, so I mean, the current priority is to look for a licensed partner at the end of phase one B. Um, if we really thought that, that the the balance of the, the risk reward financing and everything else balance of going to phase two um we could consider it we haven't really investigated the costs because i suppose it's um it, it can be disease area um uh, dependent so if we and i'm i'm, I'm talking highly speculatively here but if, if we were to look at a phase two you know, would it be psoriasis would it be something else i don't know so um, I mean, th th these are sort of things that are in the back of our minds, but we haven't we haven't got a, a costed plan for phase two because the um, so the priority is to look for the licensed partner at the end of the phase one B. Yeah, so yeah, just to add to that, a, a typical phase two A in let's say psoriasis would be looking at something like two hundred patients, two you know, hundred and twenty patients, multiple sites. Uh, you know, as many as 30 different clinical trial sites to, to recruit those patients. So it's a significant endeavor to move to phase, phase 2A. And, you know, hence our priority being to complete the phase 1B and look to license. Okay. What do you consider the most important step in validating 1801 with regard to licensing? When do you expect to hit that point? Is it the first half 2024 or more likely 2025? Um, so I think there's two aspects in the current trial. There's the safety data from the, the 1A. Um, uh, so, so this will be the end of the multiple ascending dose in healthy volunteers. Uh, I think there's two key aspects uh, we'll be looking for there. I suppose particularly if we want to compare uh, 1801 to our competitors. Uh, so one will be the, the, the PK, that's pharmacokinetics. So that's really how long the, the drug stays in the body once it's, um, uh, once it's been administered. So we'll be looking for uh, a nice, smooth, uh, long duration of action uh, from that. Um, and then there's also the, um, the side effects uh, side of it. So what, if any, side effects are seen and at what doses? Um, and then there'll be the... Uh, the phase 1b study um uh, as, as as john's noted so it's, it's quite a small study so 24 patients but we we will see some data there and and again we, we'd look to see for improvements in um in, in clinical signs so so for people's psoriasis uh, to get better <coughs> excuse me um and then also we will be running some biomarker studies so we'll, we'll be running blood tests um to see how the uh the body biochemistry uh responds uh, to the treatment uh, and again our competitors have published similar data and we'll look for comparisons to those 
and we should have that data by the end of 2024. I'll, I'll just add again, the, um, we are looking at certain biomarkers within the healthy subjects as well. So during the MAD phase in particular, um, a, a lot of biomarkers are examined. I mean, the thing is, there's no, you know, generally no background inflammation in those subjects. So uh, it's sometimes you don't get a very clear picture, but there are certain markers that we're expecting to show a response uh, to our compound and, and that will really give us a hint of the potential for future efficacy in the phase 1B study. Okay, thank you. Do you have any expectations as to what, if anything, the autumn statement might bring for life science companies such as Sarium, where tax R&D tax payments are so important? Yeah. So I think the, um, and I know in the, in the last autumn statements, um, R&D tax credits for, for small companies were essentially stripped away. Um, to a, a pretty large extent, uh, they have come back. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so, so tax credits are, are almost what they were. Um, I'm not expecting anything uh, new on that front. I mean, you know, you know, we, we have no particular insight on uh, on what the government are actually doing, but of course um, we're members of the Bio Industry Association, so that's essentially the industry lobbying body. So if there's things that we think could be done better by the government, we we can uh, lobby by the BIA um, uh, on, on that. But I think the, the 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 changes to tax credits following the last autumn statement have yet to be tried out. So I think um, yeah, I. I'm not sure that there's a big call for change uh, until we've seen how the current system actually operates. Okay, thank you. What is the strategy after phase 1B for SDC 1801? Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I suppose sort of, yeah. number one is to look for a licensed partner, um, unless there's very compelling evidence to um, either, either continue into a phase two or a, uh, a, a 1B in another disease area. Um, Say so the, the, the current focus is looking for licensed partner. Okay. Have Sarium and or CPF been able to go through all the clinical data that's been returned by Sierra? How useful is this data in supplementing what you already knew about SRA 737? Uh, I'll take this one. I um, obviously can't speak for CPF um, with respect to what we but So I've had a, a good trawl through it. I can't say that I've looked at all of it because I don't know. It, it, there's literally thousands and thousands of pages of documents in these um, uh, these trial master files and the clinical uh, study reports. So what I've done is read the summaries, gone through any particular data where. I was aware of any questions or you know um, areas of concern that we had from the preclinical studies and from the um, I suppose from the headline clinical reports, and um, just reassured myself that everything was you know as we understood it to be, which which it was. I'm happy to say. So I think yeah to summarise seven three seven, I would say it's it's got a good safety profile, and that means it's ideally suited for combining with other molecules and it's really you know i think the development path will be to identify the optimal partner to um combine 737 with the you know the optimal partner drug to combine 737 with um and there was nothing that i saw in the data that would prevent that strategy from going ahead Okay, thanks. There's a couple more on 1802, which I'll, I'll ask here. So how much longer will translational studies take with SDC 1802? And can you elaborate how 1802 will progress quicker as it is a different molecule and would still need to go through same trials, um, which would take the same time? Yeah. Um... So, so with respect to the sort of you know the preclinical, the translational studies, uh, <laughs> there's always more that can be done, right? In an experiment, um, you can always do more. But I think you know there is going to come a point where we 
have to say, you know, okay, we've done enough now. This is our, this is going to be our patient population in a, any future phase one trial. Uh, all I can say really is we're not there yet. We have not decided. And it could be that the, you know, the, the data guides us towards uh, what's called an all comers trial. So we don't identify any particular patient population, but we just go for, let's say, all solid tumor um, patients or all um, blood cancer patients or, or, or something of that. But what we're hoping to do is narrow it down uh, to a more specific subset of patients who we identify as having the best chance of responding to 1802. Uh, with respect to the timelines, yeah, um, it's really the develop the preclinical development timelines which uh, have potential to be shortened by its similarity to 1801. So, for example, the structure, the chemistry is is quite similar, and so at least the first three steps in the synthesis we've done already for 1801. And while that might not sound like a lot, it actually shaves off uh, quite a lot of development time in terms of the chemistry. But with respect to toxicology um, and any um, phase one trial, yeah, the timelines will be not, not affected by uh, our experience with SDC 1801. So it's really in the chemistry sphere where we'd, we'd expect to make some time savings. Okay. Can you confirm that the River Fort funding will take 1801 to phase 1B completion? What is the plan after that for financing? Hmm. Um, so th I think we've, we, we've touched on this al already. Um, so yes, the, the, um, the, the River Fort 5 million facility, if we fully draw it, uh, along with the anticipated tax credits, is expecting us to take, uh, take 1801 to the end of phase 1B studies. Uh, beyond that, I think we'll uh, let's say uh, we, we, we've got options well, to, to look for a licensing partner and, and, and think that's our priority uh, and obviously that will generate income. Um, so if, if, if there really is compelling reasons to continue development, um, we say which, which we're not particularly considering at the moment, but I, I guess we never say never, um, th then we'd look for for financing to cover those. But I think to, to, to reiterate and stress uh, the, the plan A uh, and probably plan B as well, you know, the, 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 the real focus is on completing that phase 1B study um, and then looking for a licensed partner. Okay, thanks. So I've maybe got a couple more questions here and I think we might have addressed um one of them already um and one's more a point of clarification actually so if the trial is blinded who actually knows who had 1801 and who had the placebo i think it's just clarifying clinical trial design yeah no, um yeah it's a, it's a it's an important question yeah somebody has to know so there's um there are a few unblinded members of the study team so uh for example in the pharmacy uh, there are unblinded people who prepare the, you know, so it's literally a little tray of capsules that is taken out to the subjects. Uh, it's, a, it, it's pushed through a hatch and the nurse picks it up and takes it to the subjects. So they're unblinded, they're preparing um, yeah, the, the capsules and the placebo capsules, which look identical, um, and pushing them through. And obviously they're keeping the records of which um, subject receives placebo and which subject receives uh, active SDC 1801 capsules. Um, and then at the other end of the process, there are um, a bioanalytical team. So they are looking at, they're analyzing blood to look at the levels of SDC 1801 in the blood at various time points after they've uh, swallowed the capsule. And so there are certain people within that group who are unblinded, uh, for example, we're not analysing the blood of the placebo uh, recipients. Um, so of necessity, the bioanalytical guys have to um, be unblinded. But then once they've generated their results, that data is re-blinded, sent over to uh, our experts in pharmacokinetic analysis, and they compile a report for us based on the re-blinded data. So we get um, a report of the average um, concentrations of SDC 1801 in the, in, the, in the blood 
of the recipients. Um, and then all of the safety data that we receive is, is blinded as well. So, you know, we're, we're looking at safety data, the laboratory uh, chemistry of the subjects in the trial, uh, you know, trying to see if there are any areas of concern, but of course not knowing if those people have received placebo or SDC 1801. So, I yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. And, and I think we'll just take this one last question, which I think we've addressed um, previously, but just to confirm, maybe Tim, is there a phase 1C or does the potential interest usually occur after the phase 1B results? I think this is talking about interest in potential deals. Yeah. So there's, there's not really such thing as a phase 1C. After the um, From phase 1B, the, the, the next step would be a phase 2A. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we're we're expecting to generate sufficient data at the one B stage uh, to enable us to get a uh, the licensing deal that we've been looking for. Uh, thank perfect. you. Perfect, and thank you very much for that. I think you've addressed all those questions you can from investors, and of course, the company will review all the questions submitted today, and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. Stephen, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today and for your continued support for, for Sarium. We do hope that we've demonstrated the continuing progress advancing 1801 through the clinic uh, and I think it's very important to add and just uh, to, to, to emphasize what's already been said that uh, every progress step that we have uh, is something which has been approved by the independent safety board looking at, at this study uh, so it's not it's not just a question of us pushing as, as, as quickly as we can through uh, through the stages, so this is this you know the the, the box is ticked every time that uh, that, that that we do. So uh, we very much look forward to the next opportunity of of sharing that progress with you. So with that, have a good day and many thanks. Bye. Perfect, and thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session, as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company and part of the management team of Sarum Holdings PLC. We'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.